<laughs> you can you can thank Lionel for the the train set. And the air so you all have passed the two challenges so far. So mm -hmm. yeah. Welcome to our lecture this evening. I do apologize for the temperature. We've gotten it fixed twice in the last two weeks. And we are still so. And I can't tell you all. That's a secret. That's a secret. Nobody can. Nobody can. Before we get started, let me uh, just give a couple of announcements of upcoming programs. Our two lectures in April, April 20th, our next lunch and learn. Uh, Dr. Michelle Harvey and Dr. Keith Mayberry will be here. Michelle is a professor here at the Marion College and Keith is a professor at Auburn University. They will be here to talk about institutional care for marginalized, marginalized people, specifically uh, looking at the history of the Hickenback community home here in Barclay County. And then on April 28th, Amelia Kocheski, who is a, a doctoral student at Emory University, will be here. And she's going to talk about the uh, Foxfire Project and its preservation of Appalachian culture and how uh, women have played an important role in that preservation project. Uh, watch your email in your mailbox for an invitation to our Margate Garden Dinner event on April the 23rd. Uh, an event that we're putting together in cooperation with the Department of Farmers to kick off the farmer's market season out here in, in the square. We're uh, working with a number of the uh, producers and farmers that participate in our market to create a culinary experience. So I encourage you to watch those invitations and get your tickets early for that. And then I want you to join Ed and me on our 5K. You don't want to share? I'll run with it. I'll walk with it. May 7th is our annual History House of 5K. If you're a runner or a walker, we'll take that too. I encourage you to come out and support the museum. That uh, 5K event does support both the Project Museum and the Rose Lawn uh, Museum. And that's a part of their May market event. So after you walk the race, Enjoy the uh, market. All right, well, without further ado, we are pleased to have with us uh, one of our very own this evening, Jordan Duncan. Jordan is one of our educators here at the museum. Jordan is originally from South Louisiana and has been a Georgia resident since 1998. He holds a bachelor's degree in world history and cultures, a certificate in public history, and a minor in classical studies from Kennesaw State University. He and his wife Chelsea live in uh, Canton. Over the last seven years, he has held various positions within the museum field. And in addition to his passion for history and history education, as you will learn this evening, Jordan is an <laughs> avid lover of all things pop culture related to music, film, animation, comic books, and video games. He's always up for a good news story, and in his spare time, he's a blogger and a podcaster. Please join me in welcoming Jordan Duncan. Thank you so much. Uh, just give me one second in the spirit of the evening. Uh, I bought this on the way over here today, actually. So, Come on, that's cool, right? That's really fun. I love these things. Uh, he won't stand, so I'll leave, leave him down right there for right now. Uh, thank you so much for coming out. Uh, also, this is actually my first official academic talk. Uh, since graduating college. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for showing interest. Uh, I, like Trey said, uh, I'm a huge nerd. I love toys. I've always loved toys growing up. I just think that there's something very fun about them. No matter what kind of toys you grew up with, everybody has their own favorite. Like everybody had a favorite toy growing up with, right? Maybe it was a stuffed animal. Maybe it was an action figure, maybe it was a hula hoop, maybe it was a video game. Like everybody has something that they just really, really love, right? Uh, and for me, I just, I always loved comic books and movies and all the action figures that kind of go with those. Um, and collecting and playing with toys is just, I feel like something very unique. And there's a, a quote here, and I've, I've got my notes here, so I'm gonna refer to my notes a lot because I have a lot of really fun stories and I don't wanna leave out interesting detail. So if I, you see me refer to my notes, uh, it's just because I, I want to give you guys the best story I can. Um, <clears throat> what's really interesting about toys is that if you're a sports fan, you can go and see sports. Like if you're a Braves fan, he's not part of the team anymore, unfortunately, but if you're a Freddie Freeman fan, you can go see Freddie Freeman play baseball for the Braves. Like Freddie Freeman is playing Freddie Freeman, right? But when you see a movie, like for instance, if you see Star Wars, you're not seeing Luke Skywalker because Luke Skywalker is not real. You're seeing 
Mark Hamill play Luke Skywalker. You're seeing somebody portray somebody. And I, and I think that's very interesting when it comes to toys because uh, this gentleman right here, John uh, Tentuto, has this really uh, interesting quote where it's, toys are a tangible symbol of a fan's love for something that just isn't real. Uh, it has no shape or form or actuality. And it's, it's a way for like these abstract ideas to become tangible. And I think that that uh, abstract idea is what really pulls us to those things that we love. But what's very interesting is like the history of toys and how they come about. Uh, you know, when you, th when you think about history, uh, come on, technical difficulties. Give me one second here. Let me tell you, maybe I should have changed the batteries. Give me one second. Do we have another one of these to try? Thank you. I'll just go ahead and do this. Oh, here we go. World events. So when you think about history and you think about world events, you really think about things that affect us on maybe a government level, right? Maybe a, a political level or world events that influence policy. Uh, you know, just for example, right up here, we've got World War II, we've got the Cold War or the Atomic Era, we've got the Civil Rights Movement. And during the 60s, during all of this, we've got the anti-war movement uh, of, of people protesting the war in Vietnam. Uh, I, I think people don't realize that a lot of these things not only affect our culture, but they go in and they affect our pop culture. And... It's evident in our films, right? How many World War II movies exist, right? Uh, it's a Wonderful Life. You know, it goes through a lot of, like, the Great Depression, goes through World War II. Uh, James Bond is big because of the espionage in the Cold War. We've got, uh, you know, the Guess Who's Coming to Dinner in the midst of the Civil Rights Movement. It's evident in our TV shows. In the 1950s, because of the Atomic Era, we start to get a big sci-fi boom. So things like the Twilight Zone become really popular. Like, how many people remember that one episode, the post-apocalyptic episode with uh, Burgess Meredith, about how he was the only person left, and he, all he wants to do is read, but then he breaks his glasses, right? Uh, so, like, all of this stuff is happening during like this beginning era of the Cold War. We've got Get Smart, and again, uh, Sesame Street holds a, a place near and dear to my heart because it was a, a very revolutionary show for 1969 when it comes to diversity on television. Um, you never really saw this kind of a diverse cast uh, in the inner city before on television until Sesame Street. Uh, we hear it in our music, Sam Cooke, A Change Is Gonna Come, one of my favorite songs, and it became, becomes a, thank you, Trey, uh, it becomes a, an anthem for the civil rights movement uh, shortly after his uh, unfortunate death. Uh, Marvin Gaye, what's going on? It's a, it's a concept album about a soldier from the Vietnam War who comes back to see his community just in shambles. Uh, Buffalo Springfield, if you know the song for what it's worth, it's about all the LA riots that were going on. And then how many of you have ever seen a Vietnam movie that didn't have Fortunate Son by Creedence Clearwater Revival in it, right? So it's... It's, but it's even in our comic books, right? Uh, and some of these characters are even created because of world events. Like Captain America is created because of World War II. Superman is actually created by two Jewish immigrants in New York because of the events that are going on in Europe. Uh, and Batman, which I find this one really interesting, this comic book cover really interesting, because he's handing a World War II soldier a gun but his whole thing is that he doesn't like guns. So I found this one very interesting and I wanted to include that. But, but once again, you see it in all forms of our art. Uh, and I, what I wanna do is I want to talk about a handful of, I can't talk about every toy out there, right? Cause it'll take forever. And I don't think anybody wants to sit here very long and listen to me talk about that. But one of the things I wanna talk about uh, is, toy companies, but I kind of want to set the stage for it. Let's give a little bit of historical context for this, right? So we are talking about a post-World War II world, okay? Uh, we enter the late 40s and the early 50s. Uh, the interstate system is starting to grow. 
suburbs are starting to become very popular. Families are starting to move out there. Uh, we enter what is called the baby boom. So a lot of people are having babies. This idea of the family is starting to come together. But there's also a big economic boom that happens at this time as well. Uh, everybody comes home from war. Everybody wants to spend money. Money, money, money. Capitalism in the middle of the 1950s. It just starts this huge economic boom. Uh, and the toy industry thrives off of this economic boom. And a lot of the toys that we know and love today are kind of a direct result of this context here. And the first one I want to talk about, if this clicker ever decides that it wants to cooperate, let me change it real quick. Is Mattel. So I'm sure you've all heard Mattel. Uh, Mattel is a big, big toy brand, still around today, still makes a lot of great toys, still makes a lot of their heavy hitters. And Mattel uh, is started in the 1940s, or uh, late 1930s, early 1940s, by a married couple, Ruth, Handler, Ruth and Elliot Handler. But they also have uh, a business partner by the name of uh, Harold Mattinson. And the name Mattel comes from Mattinson and Elliot's name. So the Matt from Mattinson and the L from Elliot. Ruth uh, is really kind of the brains behind the operation for Mattel. And she's a little miffed that she's not represented in the name, but that was just kind of the unfortunate gender roles at the time, uh, which is really upsetting because M Ruth was Mattel. Ruth was 100% Mattel. Um, and a lot of the stories that I'm going to tell you tonight, they're very easily accessible. Uh, there's tons of books that have been written about these that I'm more than happy to share uh, at the end. But <clears throat> during the 1940s, 1945 specifically, Mattel is actually a furniture company. And they're all right. They're not making tons of money. Uh, it gets to the point, though, where uh, their biggest seller is picture frames. And then they have a whole bunch of leftover wood. The, the furniture isn't selling as well as it should, but the picture frames are, are just flying off the shelves. So Elliot, who's kind of the creative behind Mattel, starts taking all of these scraps of wood and starts making dollhouse pieces. Uh, and that becomes incredibly popular, super popular, so much so that it actually, the sales of the dollhouse furniture surpasses any of the actual furniture. So Ruth is like, hey, we should probably just start making toys. And she had been trying to convince Elliot to go into the toy business for probably about a couple years now. So finally, Elliot takes the, takes the bait and he's like, okay, let's do it. So they released their first toy right here. Uh, it's a toy ukulele called the Ukadoodle. Uh, and it's pretty popular. It, they sell quite a few of these. But they also are trying to reach into a boys' market. So later on in the early 50s, they release this uh, burp gun. And I'm sure you've probably played with some of these. When you pull the trigger, it kind of has like a, like a blah, 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 blah kind of sound to it to kind of imitate the, the rapid fire of these things. Um, <clears throat> but what's very interesting, in the winter of 1956, the handlers vacation in Switzerland. During this, Ruth is really trying to come up with a new idea for a new baby doll. There's tons of baby dolls on the market, but she's really trying to find something that has this new pizzazz to it. And while they're vacationing in Switzerland, they pass by this shop and they come across this shop display with this doll called the Build Lily Doll. Now, the Build Lily Doll is part of a comic strip uh, for the Build publication in Germany. And it's not a children's doll. Uh, as a matter of fact, her comic strip is actually pretty risque. These were the two most tame comic strips that I could actually find <laughs> to put up on here. <laughs> Because let me tell you, if you do a quick Google search for Build Lily, there are some doozies. Uh, and basically, it was an adult comic strip for adult German men who had just come back from the war. And 
what they did was they made this build Lily doll as a gag gift. It wasn't for children. It was actually for, for guys that would pass around to other guys at bachelor parties. Or if there was a guy interested in a girl and he got the doll for the girl, it would kind of it would kind of tell her what he was just really interested in. So B Lily was not really uh, for children, but the thing that Ruth uh, the, made the light bulb go off uh, in Ruth's head was that she saw how her daughter Barbara and Kenneth would look at that, and she thought. I wonder if I can somehow take this idea back to America and repackage it and see what, I, see what they could come up with. Um, <clears throat> so what happens is when they get back, Ruth, oh God, Jack Ryan. Uh, Ruth enlists the help of this Mattel employee by the name of Jack Ryan, and this dude is a character. When I tell you this man has lived tons of lives in one, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, he, he's an engineer, and his first job was like, creating missiles for the US government. Uh, he couldn't find j more jobs making missiles, so he took a job at Mattel to design toys. Uh, what's very interesting is that she brings him on to brainstorm, and the deal that she comes up with uh, to pay Jack is this. Um, <clears throat> instead of paying him, she gives him a small percentage of royalties for each toy that he creates that is sold. Right? So for every uh, doll, not just every doll under one line, but every single doll that does sell, he gets a little, like, a little bit of percentage. And this works out very well for, uh, in his favor because the dude marries Zsa Zsa Gabor at some point in time. Uh, he gets invited to, because of his wealth and his, uh, his reputation, he gets invited to parties at the Playboy Mansion. This dude is just living his life. Uh, the downside, though, is that he did, unfortunately, have a problem with drugs and alcohol, um, which is, I don't want to say it was ultimately his downfall, but that didn't help him in the long run. But the point is, Jack Ryan is the guy that really focuses and finalizes what this new doll is going to be. Uh, the articulation that this doll has, the design that this doll has, uh, it's all really Jack Ryan. But Ruth, though, it's still her baby. And that doll, as you can probably have guessed by now, is Barbie, named after her daughter, Barbara. Uh, Barbie is introduced, it goes into production for had about three years. So from 56 to 59, it goes into production, and they're trying to brainstorm. They actually get a lot of pushback for this, uh, especially for like a lot of the males who work for Mattel, because at the end of the day, they're like, I don't think any girl wants a doll that has actual breasts. And I think that that is a very ridiculous statement to make, but that was what was, uh, what was thought at the time. And Ruth's idea wasn't, well, there's I don't want to give him another baby doll because there's tons of baby dolls on the market. Ruth wanted Barbie to embody a woman at, at a more mature place in her life and give, uh, give something for little children to kind of like look in, uh, you know, aspire to growing up. Um, <clears throat> but like I said, she goes in, Barbie goes into production for three years and makes her debut in the 1959 Toy Fair. Uh, initially, the buyers for all of the toys, or the toy retailers, were not interested in Barbie for the aforementioned reason that it was a doll with breasts. Ruth doubles down on Barbie and puts $500,000 in advertising for Barbie during the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse uh, show. That's a lot of money in 1959, right? Uh, and this works because there was a very specific line in the ad that said, um, I'll make you believe that I'm just like you. And to little girls, that really humanized the doll. And after that ad, uh, little girls loved it. Barbie exploded onto the scene. And after Barbie hits her stride, Ruth and Elliot start to innovate, or innovate with different versions of the doll. Uh, Barbie herself wasn't too incredibly expensive. I know you and I today look at that price tag and like $3. Uh, 
That's not a lot. Uh, that's about $30 adjusted for today, which, uh, you know, I, there are a couple of uh, toy collectors here in this room. I'm not going to name names, Jason. But, <laughs> but $30 for an action figure today seems almost normal, right? So uh, this was something that was kind of the norm. And the big deal was that you would buy one Barbie doll, and then you would just buy all of the accessories, right? So Barbie had all of these cool clothes for the time. This one right here was the first Barbie dream house. I, uh, I'm a big sucker for mid-century modern aesthetics, so I really, actually, I think I like a lot of the furniture that Barbie has in her dream house. Um, and then it wasn't, what's that? Oh, do you? Do you have the box? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> So uh, Barbie ends up selling very well for a couple of years. And then in 1961, we get introduced to Barbie's boyfriend, Ken. Uh, and Ken, obviously named after her son, Kenneth. So uh, once again, Ken, he costs about $350. So, and the same idea with Barbie goes with Ken. You buy one Ken doll, he comes in blonde or brunette, or blonde or brown hair. And then you buy a whole bunch of the accessories. And this was a huge seller for that whole part of the beginning of the 60s. But what happens in actual culture is we start to see a counterculture in, in the middle of the 60s. And uh, we see that a lot of feminist movements are actually starting to rise. And Barbie becomes kind of public enemy number one because to the feminist movement, Barbie kind of normalizes those gender roles of being either a wife or a homemaker. So Ruth saw this, and Ruth's like, no, I want a doll for everybody. So Barbie goes, uh, undergoes a little bit of a change, and this is what really starts Barbie reinventing herself almost every other decade, is right here. Uh, we actually see Barbie start to actually have jobs. We see that she's an astronaut. Keep in mind, again, this is in the middle of a space race, right? We, we're in the middle of a decade where JFK said, no, we're going to put somebody on the moon. Spoiler alert, we did that in 1969. Uh, but you see astronaut Barbie. I uh, believe Barbie has a number of other uh, professions at the time. But we also have the civil rights movement going on. So up until this point, Barbie is a white doll. And so there's a whole community of uh, people in you know, the entire African American community that just can't see themselves in a Barbie doll. So Ruth's answer to that was Christy, who was uh, added in 1968 and was a huge hit. So uh, this is a direct response to that civil rights movement that was going on. Uh, and this one's actually come by my favorite, the Mod Pack. Uh, I'm a big 60s British Invasion guy, so a lot of Beatles, Stones, Kinks. Uh, and the, the Mod movement was happening uh, in Britain in the middle of the 60s, and this is just kind of a play off the, that Mod movement in England. Um, Small Faces was another really good band from the Mod movement. But, uh, so Barbie really starts to power along. And then, we get into the 70s, and much like the 60s, styles change, and popular culture dictates how Barbie starts to look. Right? Popular shows like Charlie's Angels with the Farrah Fawcett uh, flip hair, we start to see that evident in all of these Barbie dolls. But something happens to not only Jack, but also Ruth in the 1970s. Uh, Jack, in 1974, actually sues Mattel for non-payment of royalties. And this lawsuit went on for about five whole years. Eventually, uh, Ryan won, but it really, really took a toll on him. This is when he started to dive uh, heavily into that drugs and alcohol that I told you about earlier. Um, <clears throat> this was also kind of like the final nail in the coffin for the friendship between Ruth and Ryan. It was already strained, but this was kind of like that last bit. So after all of this was said and done, in 1978, 
Ruth gets indicted, indicted for fraud, for lying about what their stock was worth. Uh, she blames senior management and ends up going on a very public trial. And uh, she gets out kind of like with a slap on a wrist, a low fine, and some community service. Uh, however, the execs at Mattel didn't like this at all, and they pretty much ousted both of them from the company that they created. And I mean, if you were ousted by a company that you created, would it sit well with you? No, this really didn't sit well with Ruth, but you know, unfortunately, her time with the company was, was done. But Barbie, however, thrives in the 80s. And this is when Barbie becomes glamorous. Barbie gets the big hair. Uh, there's a lot of hair metal going on in the middle of the 1980s. I don't know if anybody is a big fan of like Poison or Motley Crue, but that was a big thing as well. Uh, also, this one comes with a cassette, if that tells you anything. <laughs> Uh, but what's really cool about the Rockers is that this was actually a direct response to uh, a toy and a cartoon that another company was making at the time. Can anybody guess what the cartoon from the middle of the 1980s was? Jim and the Holograms, exactly. So it was a very popular cartoon. There was a Jim and the Holograms was a, a pop band, and they had a anti-pop band called the Misfits. Not of the, not the same band from the 1970s punk scene. But because that was gaining traction, Barbie needed to become a rocker as well. So that was a big thing in the 80s for Barbie. But then we move on to the 90s. And I wanted to include this one because to date, this is the best-selling Barbie doll of all time. The totally hair Barbie with long hair that's crimped. Uh, and it, I, I believe it grows too, if I'm not mistaken. But it also comes with hair gel. And I don't know if anybody remembers the popularity of shows in the early 90s like Beverly Hills 90210, Melrose Place, but all those dudes had spiky hair from hair gel and there was a lot of, uh, a lot of women were using hair gel too. So uh, I, I included this one only because, uh, again, to this day, it's the best-selling Barbie doll of all time, which is kind of weird if you think about it for it to be like almost 30 years after it came out and then you have your best-selling one, right? But what's really interesting, Barbie powers along through the, through the new millennium and she actually comes across a, a little bit of competition. There's this new doll on the scene called Bratz and they kind of have like a little bit of an attitude like that late generation X, early millennial kind of anti-authority uh, attitude to them. But Barbie still kind of plays it safe. Uh, whenever the Bratz dolls come out. But then we're going to flash forward all the way to 2016. And Mattel does something smart. In this, in this world where people are asking for more diversity and being able to see themselves in more spaces, uh, being able to be accepted in more, uh, more spaces, somebody at Mattel had this good sense to say, well, why are we only doing one size and one shape of Barbie? There are many people out there that are different sizes and different, everybody's built different. So why can't we make more dolls of people of color, but also different body types and sizes and shapes? Because that's what we're all here for anyway, is we want everybody to be able to see themselves in this toy. So Mattel releases the Barbie Fashionista line, and you can just see the immense, that this isn't even at all of them this immense diversity we see in this line. But again, just kind of showing you how current events are actually going into some of the ideas that these toys have. Um, sadly, Ruth passes away in 2002, but her legacy of Barbie really, like, I mean, it's still going on today. Um, and it was because of her and that doll she saw in Switzerland in a window that really started this entire revolution of Barbie itself. And I think that's incredibly fascinating because whenever I started to research Barbie, I'm like, it's a doll. And I found like all of this stuff out. And I'm like, oh, this is a way more interesting story than I was ever expecting it to be. So for right now, we're going to put a pin in Mattel and Barbie while I rehydrate. And we are going to skip over to another popular toy company, Hasbro. <clears throat> Hasbro was founded in 1923 by three brothers, 
Henry, uh, Henry Halal Herman Hassenfeld. They were Polish immigrants, and they started the Hassenfeld, the, uh, Hassenfeld Brothers, Inc. It isn't until the 1950s where they, uh, one of the sons, whoop, one of the sons, Merrill Hassenfeld, uh, joins the company. And we see uh, Merrill really wants to make a name for himself. Because up until that point, they're not making toys. They're really just making pencil boxes. But Merrill really wants to jump into the toy, uh, the toy business. And he has this idea. Uh, that is also the only picture of Merrill Hassenfeld I could find. Uh, he's much younger than this when he joins the company and he does this. But he has this idea for a toy called Mr. Potato Head. And Mr. Potato Head is actually the first toy that was ever advertised on television in 1952, which I think is very fascinating. But Mattel, uh, I'm sorry, Hasbro has a huge hit with uh, Mr. Potato Head. And then uh, we come across this guy. His name is Stan Weston. So Hasbro has a really big hit with Mr. Potato Head. And then they have a couple of blunders. There is a, a toy called Flubber that was a movie tie-in to the film Flubber. And it just doesn't sell well. Uh, it almost makes Hasbro go uh, bankrupt. But they're also getting hammered by Mattel in Barbie sales. So Merrill thinks, Hasbro needs a Barbie. What can I do? So he meets with this guy, Stan Weston, who is an independent contractor at the time. And he comes up with this idea for an army man doll. G.I. Joe. But he's not G.I. Joe yet. Uh, first off, they have a big issue with calling it a doll because at the time, you know, boys don't play with dolls, right? So they have to brainstorm on a new thing, a new way to call this. Action figure. So this is the first time a toy becomes called an action figure. Uh, and in, keep in mind, this is the late 50s. Um, you know, we're still in the midst of the beginning of the Cold War. World War II is still on the minds of people. Tons of war movies are on TV after school. Uh, so having a toy of an army man just kind of made sense. Also, army man toys were nothing new. How many of you have played with little green army men? Yeah, so this idea was just, it was, it was sitting right there. But what they thought was, well, let's do a Barbie, but give it more articulation, and it'll be an army man. Uh, they eventually settle on the name G.I. Joe after the movie, uh, 1945 movie, the story of G.I. Joe. Uh, and they take the Barbie approach. They just pack it out with accessories. Uh, you buy a G.I. Joe. And there was four. There was uh, one for Army, Navy, uh, Military, and Air Force as well. <clears throat> However, the, what happens <laughs> is there's a little snag. Right before the 1964 60, Toy Fair, Merrill realizes that he doesn't own the rights but because Stan Weston was the independent contractor that helped come up with this idea that he owns the rights. So Hassenfeld offers Weston 1% of the profits made. Weston counters, and he, the two attempt to negotiate. Uh, Hassenfeld finally says, listen, how about right here, right now, I'll buy you out for $100,000. Weston, being a, an, an independent contractor of the time, didn't know when his next paycheck was going to come. So right then and there, in that moment, that made the smartest move. It was like, sure, I'll take the $100,000. In hindsight, that's not really a good idea, right? Because we know what the G.I. Joe franchise has done today. So G.I. Joe debuts at the Toy Fair and then hits the stores, and it's only met with moderate interest. So Hassenfeld pulls this move. He calls all of his sales distributors, and he says, I want you to go to every Woolworth in New York and buy up all of the stock. So that's what they do. They go, they buy up all of the stock. And what happens is word catches on to other toy retailers that G.I. Joe is just selling out. So those toy retailers start to order more G.I. Joe. And then more G.I. Joe in the stores means more kids see the toys, more, to more kids buy the toys. And then G.I. Joe just kind of exploded after that. So he kind of like worked his success in, in, a, in a really uh, interesting way. Um, but much like Barbie, uh, G.I. Joe is met from the 1960s counterculture, right? Towards the middle of the 60s, 
the war in Vietnam is going on, and G.I. Joe, the, the army man of G.I. Joe, starts to get associated with this. And not in a good way, in a very negative way. Uh, so much so that parents just don't want to buy army man toys for their children anymore. So G.I. Joe has to go through a facelift. G.I. Joe is no longer an army man. He's an adventurer. He goes deep sea diving. Like Barbie, he goes to the moon. He becomes an astronaut. So G.I. Joe, as we know in its original iteration, doesn't really kind of survive much past this. He's got a little bit of life left in him. But in the 1970s, a couple of things happen to G.I. Joe. There is no a G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe becomes the adventure team. They look a little bit more rugged, a little bit more diverse. That's what the A and the T stand for right there, the adventure team. Uh, I appreciate this guy's ginger beard right here, personally. Uh, G.I. Joe is a 12-inch figure. But then there's an oil crisis in the mid, middle of the 70s. So in order to cut costs, G.I. Joe goes from 7 inches, or I'm sorry, goes from 12 inches to 8 inches. Um, but what happens in the middle of the 70s is some friends from a galaxy far, far away make their debut, uh, who we will talk about. Uh, and G.I. Joe doesn't really recover. And what happens is they kind of pull the plug on G.I. Joe around 77, 78. But then something happens in the 80s. Uh, in the beginning of the 80s, we're kind of, we're, we've just wrapped up the Iranian hostage situation. Uh, there's a very popular movie about 10 years ago that was made, Ar uh, Argo was made about it. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Uh, but also, Ronald Reagan gets inducted or gets inaugurated as president, and there's this kind of like new era of conservatism that's sweeping through America, uh, and there's this renewed idea of patriotism in America, and Hasbro thinks this is a fantastic time to reboot GI Joe. Uh, but what happens is, with the success of our friends from a galaxy far, far away, and their their scale. That's how Hasbro decides to uh, market their new, new uh, G.I. Joe. So G.I. Joe becomes the real American hero. And their toys go from 12 inches to 8 inches to 3 and 3 quarter inches. But what's very interesting about these guys is that they get a whole new backstory. G.I. Joe isn't a guy. G.I. Joe is a team. They're actually an anti-terrorist team. And they fight against a group called Cobra. They get a really cool Marvel comic book. But then they also get this really awesome cartoon that people still love today. I still love watching G.I. Joe. Um, <clears throat> but then the toys come out. And the toys, once again, are kind of about this big. And there's just tons of them. The toys are so cheap. They're probably like you know, $3 a figure at the time. But this ushers in more marketing for more toys. You can now buy vehicles where all your G.I. Joes can, can ride in and fly in. But then this guy comes out. And this is like, if you're a G.I. Joe toy collector, this is the creme de la creme. This is the USS flag. Uh, my friend Jason and I were actually at a toy show recently, a couple weeks ago. And somebody had one of these in the box that was graded. And they were trying to get $40,000 for one of these. Because it's the other vehicles. That's bonkers. This, this thing right here is probably about from where I am to almost the table. Like it's, or I'm sorry, the end of the table. It's very large. So G.I. Joe, uh, and I, I put those pictures in just because I miss toy stores. <laughs> so, but you know, you don't see toy stores anymore and you don't see toy aisles like this anymore. Um, but it was a big deal. Like this is how well they sold whenever they had rebooted themselves. But G.I. Joe kind of stays like this uh, to the G.I. Joe that we know and love today. Um, I do want to talk real quick about Mego. In the 1970s, uh, Mego is a company that makes about 8-inch figures. They're competing with G.I. Joe. But what's interesting about Mego is they start to license uh, comic book characters, like DC. So they've got like a DC and Marvel. There's Conan the Barbarian. But they also do more. They start to license television shows. And they start to license films, which leads me into my next slide. There was a small indie flick that came out in 1977, perhaps you've heard of it, called Star Wars. Uh, Star Wars was uh, a film created by George Lucas. It's one of my favorite films of all time. Uh, but Kenner 
the toy company Kenner actually starts to get or gets the rights for Star Wars. Um, <clears throat> to date, this franchise has made like seven billion dollars at the box office, and the toys have made fourteen billion dollars. It's it is bonkers. Uh, but when the movie comes out, there are no toys on the shelf, which is baffling because kids love this movie. And I can only speak for myself, but there was a time when I hadn't seen Star Wars, and then I saw Star Wars, and then everything after was different. I can't explain it. It's that good of a movie. Uh, but So Kenner had to act fast. They needed to put plastic on the pegs. And this guy right here, Bernie Loomis, was the head of Kenner at the time. And there he is with uh, this upstart film director uh, by the name of George Lucas. Um, <clears throat> and Bernie Loomis is famous for this, uh, I, this phrase called toyetic, which is how playable a toy is. Like, how, how, can you, like, how playable can it be? Um, and Loomis had the final call on how big the main character, Luke Skywalker, was going to be. And he was having this conversation with this guy named Dave Okada, who worked for Kenner at the time, and said, listen, we're on a time crunch. We need to get these toys in production. The movie's already out. Uh, how big is Luke Skywalker going to be? So Bernie Loomis does this thing where he said, the toys are going to be this big. So Okada takes a ruler and measures it out to three and three quarters. And then that's how big the main character will be, and that's how big everybody else will be scaled to. Because there's tons of vehicles that come out with this as well. Uh, and I have a slide for that too. I just included a couple of my favorite ones. Oh, <clears throat> real quick, let me back up. To make these toys go to market, they had to act fast. And they had a two-point plan. One was just called label slapping. And label slapping was when you had a pre-existing toy, but you want to capitalize off the popularity of something, so you just put a Star Wars sticker on it. So this already existed, but let's put a Star Wars sticker on it. Boom, it's a Star Wars toy. Uh, it was cheap, but it was highly effective. The second thing was uh, the early bird special. By December of 1977, there are still no toys on the shelf. Uh, and at the, for the time, Star Wars is the highest grossing film uh, up to date. So they make this idea of this early bird certificate where it's like, hey, we promise that the toys are coming, buy this, fill out a form, and then when you mail it to us, you will be the first kids to get this, these uh, first Star Wars toys. And it was a huge hit. Uh, that's what it looks like when you put them all together. Uh, these are highly sought after right here, especially this Luke Skywalker. Um, <clears throat> these are just a couple of my favorite Star Wars <laughs> vehicles. Uh, the Millennium Falcon and an AT-AT. Uh, I know that this is a very big cause of uh, heat in the Star Wars community. Is it an AT-AT or an AT-AT? I say AT-AT because AT is a word. And it's just easier for me to say. Um, <clears throat> By 1983, after Return of the Jedi comes out, uh, they have about 96 figures in total. I tried to find a picture of an, was a 96 back, but I could not find one that was clear. So this is the clearest one I could find, but there are tons of characters within the Star Wars universe. But this, Star Wars wasn't the first toy line to utilize the three and three quarter scale, but it was probably arguably the one that made it the most popular. Uh, there was a line before this called Micronauts uh, that was kind of popular, but they also used this scale. Um, I'm going to move on because I only have a few more minutes, but I want to talk about my favorite toy line of all time, the Transformers. As for uh, my t-shirt I'm wearing. <clears throat> so our story with Transformers starts in a post-war Japan. Um, <clears throat> the relationship between America and Japan at this time is pretty volatile. You know, World War II just ended. You know, two atomic bombs were dropped on them. Uh, but America wants to help J Japan get back on its feet. So a lot of metals that were left over from American bases starts to get recycled to the uh, Japanese economy. And this actually helps their toy economy boom. And we actually see a lot of these toys from these metals, uh, like these little spaceships or robots. But what happens in Japan is there's a huge sci-fi boom. Uh, how many of us have seen Godzilla? It's one of my favorite movies. Um, Japan in the 1960s has, starts to have this interest in giant robots. So a lot of their cartoons and their manga, the anime, uh, we get uh, Astro Boy. We get uh, what in America it was called um, Gigantor. 
but in Japan here, my note is, so this was Adam Boy in Japan, Astro Boy here in America. And this was Tet Tetsujin 28, but here it was called Gigantor, and then we have Ultraman here. Uh, so all of this gets exported to America. But in return, Takara takes interest, this toy company called Takara takes interest in America's number one action figure, which at the time is G.I. Joe. However, it doesn't sell well. Remember, the war is still very fresh in people's minds. Do we think a lot of Japanese parents want to buy an American soldier toy for a lot of their children? Not so much. So they have to do something to G.I. Joe in order to make him sell. So what do they do? They turn him into a robot. So they take G.I. Joe, they cast him in translucent plastic, and they give him some robot innards, uh, and they call him the Henshin Cyborg, which stands for like changed body or transformed body. But we're not quite there to Transformers yet. Uh, once again, in the 70s, we ha hit that oil crisis. So size of toys gets scaled down. So Henshin Cyborg gets shrunk down to Microman. But Microman also has a lot of these really cool, fun play sets. And this is a really big hit. Uh, a handful of years, uh, they, uh, they're selling off the shelves. But then, uh, Takara comes up with another idea called Diaclone. So Microman gets shrunk down again to about one inch tall. So those little toys can pilot the big giant robot. Diaclone is a huge hit in the late 70s and the early 80s. But then sales start to wane. So instead of doing really crazy robots that look like spaceships, they decide to do something called Diaclone Car Robo. So we see a lot more uh, actual vehicles being made, like these little race cars, the 18-wheeler. Some of these probably look familiar to you already. Uh, but in conjunction with Car Robo, Diaclone also does another line called, uh, oh, there's another one right here for the Car Robo, all these construction vehicles. Uh, they also do a line called Micro Change, which just, instead of cars, it's just a bunch of stuff lying around the house. It's a Walkman, it's a camera, some tiny cars, some cassette tapes. But Hasbro goes over to Japan, sees how popular they are, and they start buying up rights to all of these transforming Siri. robot. No, Siri. go away, Siri. Starts buying up the rights to all of these trans transforming robots and brings them to America, and they Frankenstein them together to create the Transformers. So these probably look a little familiar from a couple slides ago. But they're just toys. They need to put, uh, they need to put a story together. So once again, they hire Marvel Comics to make a comic book. Uh, we get a cartoon, we get the classic Optimus Prime, who's my favorite cartoon character of all time, uh, and versus Megatron. And Transformers uh, ends up being a really big hit, and had, it really reinvents itself every decade or so. So they rode a wave of popularity through the 80s. In the beginning of the 90s, it gets rebooted. It sells okay. But then in the late 90s, it reboots as Beast Wars. And so instead of robots turning into vehicles, they turn into animals. And since then, there have been so many reboots of it that, uh, I mean, they all kind of run together. But uh, it's been an incredible, um, an incredible uh, franchise, especially for me. Uh, this guy right here is actually one of my favorites. <laughs> so uh, unfortunately, I'm running out of time, so I won't be able to talk about the Atari if you want to know more, uh, I'm more than happy to stick around after. But I did want to allow time for questions, if anybody had any questions. You've just been so <laughs> well, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I was really nervous. I'm like, no one's going to want to hear me talk for an hour about toys. I never knew how Barbie and Ken got your name. Mm -hmm. That's what I was going to ask you. Was the Christie That's a that's a good question. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I, I would probably have to look a, look into that one a little bit more. Right. Right. So I mean, yeah, uh, that's a, that's a good question. So unfortunately, I don't have the answer. But I'll give me a week. I'll see what I can find out for you. Yes. 
there are a lot of people that like to bootleg old Star Wars toys and pass them off as uh, authentic vintage Star Wars toys. Uh, there are a lot of um, bootlegs that come, uh, come out of China, especially for Transformers. But what's really ironic is that a lot of bootlegs today are actually made really well. A lot of them actually get made on the same assembly line that the actual toys get made off of. Uh, but some people just pocket pieces and then sell them on the internet. So, um, but yes, that that is that is a big a big uh, thing in the collecting community, especially. So. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a really good question. Uh, I would assume, at that point in time. They were probably made in America, but I don't really have a solid answer for that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, that I don't know. So. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, absolutely. You have a question? What is it? Oh, it's definitely meant for uh, people who grew up with it originally. Like right now, we're in a big era of nostalgia. And I think it's also these franchises that all have staying power, right? Like Star Wars has been here for. 45 years, I'm going on 50 years. Transformers has been around for 40 years. G.I. Joe just celebrated a 40th anniversary. I think these companies know that the people that grew up with them now have families of their own, and they want to market not only to the parent, but the child. So you want to get the nostalgia from the parent, but you also want to get those new fans with the children. So I think it's kind of like a, a, a double marketing ploy on that one. And it works because I buy a lot of them. I don't have any children of my own, but I, I'm a nerd and I, I spend a lot of my money on these things. So uh, more than happy to answer any more questions if you want to hang around. But before we end, I actually want to, uh, Trey, get up here. I want to thank you for trusting me with this talk because Buddy, you had to be scared. So, I apologize that we didn't get anyone passionate about toys to talk tonight. Mm -hmm. You had to settle for this guy. But as a thank you, I wanted to give you your set of Star Wars toys. So these are all yours. These right here are all for you to put in your office. Yes, I can, because they were specifically acquired for you. Because I know that you're a big Star Wars guy. So, so thank you so much for trusting me with this talk. So those well, are for you. Thank you for the talk. <laughs> no, Chewy! <laughs> he goes in your pocket. <laughs> Chewy's one of my favorites. And you just dropped them this like you did. Thank you so You're much. very welcome. Thank you. I don't, I don't know about you all. Um, well, those of us that are children of the 80s, that brought a whole lot of memories. Mm -hmm. I'm in the 40s and the 50s, so even, you know, it's interesting, you said my favorite toy growing up was dollhouses, mm -hmm. and to this day, I have a lot of things that are like wooden houses, wooden things, I mean, that's, you know, you kind of gravitate towards what you did as a child. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, oh, I should have taken pictures of my office at home, it's... it's ridiculous. <laughs> my wife very, like, lovingly puts up with it, too. <laughs> Thank you, so, Jordan. That was terrific. Thank you. Uh, I actually want to hear your Atari story, so I may stick around. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Thank you all for coming. If you want to stick around, Jordan would be happy to answer more questions. Come see our exhibit again at Harvey Glenn Center. Yeah. Um, and we'll have to see if you can go soon. Right. Yes. I want to suggest that you recruit him from another group. Absolutely. No, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.